Welcome to the end of Season 2. Things have gotten interesting, I think. Um, maybe it's just me. And... How do I put this? I enjoy Babylon 5, obviously. In fact, in this particular rewatching, I have even found myself enjoying Season 1 more than I normally do. Maybe that's because I have analysis mode on, and I've even caught a few things that I hadn't caught before. Although one of those is apparently new to the edition. Whatever. Point being, however that, as I've been going through, I still enjoy Season 1. I'm one of those people who defends Season 1 and Season 2, but mostly just Season 1 of Babylon 5, uh, despite its detractors. But even I can't deny that now's where we're really getting to the good stuff. But again, and I've said this so many times, it wouldn't be the good stuff without that establishment, without two seasons of build-up and establishment and understanding, knowing the characters, knowing the pieces on the board, knowing the board itself. If you don't know the game of chess, when someone pulls some starts, when things start getting tense, when someone pulls a brilliant stratagem, it doesn't mean anything to you if you don't know how chess is, what chess is, right? This is an analogy I've, I've used before. Uh, when I've talked about creative writing and, you know, build-up, you know, the slow boil thing. You have to know the rules of the game, know the pieces, know the, how they can move in order to really get the impact, right? It's the same thing with a story. Anyways, point being, this is, well, I, this is me forgetting to mute my phone. <laughs> uh... This episode does two things really smart with its tactics. One, it's the first time we really see the point defenses on display. Oh, excuse me. And two, the way they talk about starfighter tactics actually really appeals to me because it makes a lot of sense. The idea that some races are more tolerant of G-forces makes sense, but more to the fact, the fact that the Centauri are willing to black out and go into autopilot temporarily just to get an optimal firing line. That actually is actually really interesting and is a tactical choice on behalf of the Centauri and therefore makes the whole point of tactical exercises you know, relevant. It, it's just smart writing. It's, it's kind of rare in my experience. Maybe I'm just used to Star Trek where they actually have real military tactics involved in, in the show. But anyways. Then we have Veer. Veer. Excuse me, got to say that right. And Lanier. <laughs> What's funny is everything they say actually does apply to both Delenn and Londo, even though the obvious main thrust of the discussion is about Londo. This is not exactly the first time we've seen both Lanier and Veer in a, a light that is intended to be humorous, but at the same time also emphasizes that they're smarter than they look. So Sheridan invites Londo up. And, he sa and Lando says, we need a buffer room. Buffer room. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into it, but I'm sure some of you know what that means from a little post-World War II history. The, uh, you know, the, yeah. Um, <clears throat> first of all, it's kind of a horrible concept when you really think about it. But here's, here's the thing that really made me think about the buffer zone idea, because there's really only two ways to think about it. One, you never intend to fully settle the territory you've claimed. So that's effectively not really your borders. So whoever's there, their entire purpose is to be a, a buffer between you and your enemies. Okay. That's horrible because you've effectively... Uh, conquered people and forced them into a form of a vassalage in order to serve as a meat shield. Or, and this is much more insidious and honestly more Centauri, you have conquered this place to be a buffer zone and intend to slowly localize it, urbanize it. Um, there's actually a term for that and I can't think of it right now. Uh, gentrify, we'll go with that. You slowly gentrify it so it's more Centauri until the point where that is now the border. But this is the border now, so we need another buffer zone. So you move forward again. This is actually a strategy that's been employed several times in real life. Uh, but I, I, I find it interesting when it's applied in fiction, because usually in fiction it's applied rather extensively. The idea being, oh, we need we need a buffer zone. Oh, we need a buffer zone. Oh, we need a buffer zone. You get the idea. Huge, huge props to Peter Jurassic for his acting, as ever. He is always just 
absolutely nailed the part of Londo. I think that's one of the big reasons why I, he is my favorite character on the show. Look at his face as he's talking to Sheridan. Look at the way he, he acts, the way he functions. He's got the mask on, but it just keeps slipping. It's so difficult for him to keep that mask on. The best demonstration of his keeping the mask on is actually right at the end, when he's doing this, and he's ranting, and he's screaming. It's gotten to the point where Londo has to actually go into theatrics to keep the mask on. When he's in a quiet, private interaction with people he actually has some respect for, like Sheridan, it just kind of keeps slipping off. And then Garibaldi, just in case the audience didn't catch it, immediately hits the nail on the head and says, Look into his eyes. See the fear there. He won't back down until he stops being afraid. And just absolutely nails that part. And it amuses me to no end that Garibaldi, of all people, would catch that. He should. He's not only the detective, he's his friend. Also, Londo tells Sheridan about delusions of grandeur. You won't survive them. For most people, that would probably sound like a threat. I don't think it is. This is just my interpretation. But I think that's a warning. I think that's a, you don't want to be someone important, Sheridan. Trust me, kind of a situation. And I love that. I find it fascinating. So, this episode is an interesting twist. We've seen in the past uh, couple of episodes, actually, how Jakar's cooperation with others has led to benefits, right? This seems like a really big payoff of that. One of their heavy cruisers survived the war. Now, I don't know how to properly emphasize that, and this is also a bit of interpretation, but based on the way they talk about it, based on how it's used in the future, obviously I've seen the rest of the series, a heavy cruiser, even one heavy cruiser, is a big deal. It is a major asset. And JMS himself has gone on record as saying that he wanted the capital ships of Babylon 5 to really mean something. So, this is a big deal. And this is a huge payoff. They have been barely surviving. They've been barely struggling. We get the medical aid. We get them supplies. We get them repairs. We get. We aren't able to fully refurbish them, but we are able to get them out and get them alive and keep them going. And it's, of course, wonderful to see Robin Sox again as Nicole. I don't think this is a spoiler. More of a, you know, it's going to be awesome for those of you who haven't seen this show before or are watching it with me. Nicole. He'll be back in the future. So this whole thing, this is a big victory. This heavy cruiser and Robin Sox as Nicole. This is a big victory for the for the forces of the good guys, for lack of a better term. For the Army of Light. Let's just call it what it is, because it's been named now. Here's the thing. The definition of a hope spot in a literary trope is when things start to get better, only for them to get worse than they were before. This episode is, by definition, a hope spot. Things have finally started turning... You know, the, the, the Centauri and Narn War ended in a horrible way, so things just plummeted, right? And then over the last two episodes, things have been inching forward with just little bits of hope and little bits of possibility. And then in this episode, it's like, oh, it's starting to turn around. No, it's much worse than it was before. But I do like the fact that... Well, I'll get into that in a minute. So let's talk about Zack. He actually plays a surprisingly important role in this episode, even though he basically only has two scenes, and one of them he's not talking in it. I talked previously about complacency, about the three tiers of collaboration, right? The, 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 psych, uh, the, 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 the people who are just following orders by stabbing babies, the people who are making the knives that are stabbing babies, and the people who have nothing to do with any of that. And I guess technically there's a fourth tier, which is the people who are ordering the people to stab babies, you know, if you really want to go into it. Zack has clearly and definitively been kind of in the I'm just making the knives category. Even though he's actually one of the people on the line, this episode makes what I presumed in the previous episode adamantly 100% apparent. He hasn't been reporting on anyone. He's been wearing the arm badge. And he has not had anything to say. Now the funny thing is, that's not laziness on his part. He honestly hasn't thought there's anything to report. Then the hammer falls. All your other comrades have been reporting things. 
And the way they're phrased, God, the writing in the script is excellent. Pay attention to the word choice as Mr. Evil, I actually don't remember his name, you know, the Night Watch guy, uh, starts just listing all the things that other people have been reporting. And then he says with a bit of incredulity, you really don't have anything to report? But then, see, here's the thing. That whole scene, that was a threat. The whole point of that scene is he was threatening Zack in a very quiet, political sort of way. All your comrades have found things to report on, and you have found nothing. Here's a list. Look at all these things. Okay. Now, there's something called the carrot and the stick approach. Uh, that can actually be applied in two different ways. Uh, to be as blunt as possible, it can be applied in the insidiously evil way, or in the I'm trying to help you way, okay? I'll talk more about that dichotomy later, because it's actually relevant to this episode. In this case, it's clearly being presented in the insidiously evil way. Because the threat is never spoken. The stick is never brandished. It's just that little implication. We'll start reporting on you, if you don't start reporting on them. And then, rather than go forward with that, rather than carry through on the threat, he's like, he offers out a carrot and says, why don't you just confirm something? We already know the individual. We already know that you know, certain things have said. Why don't you just confirm the report? And Z notice Zach's total discomfort. And is he, because, because A, you get the impression he realizes the line he's about to cross. And B, he realizes he's kind of being pushed over it because there's a bunch of people sitting behind him with knives to carry forward the analogy into a ridiculous degree. Because everyone else in the room is just staring at him. You gonna, you gonna fall into line, Zach? And he finally says, yeah, fine, yeah, he's... And I hate to skip forward, but right at the end of the episode, the second to last scene, we see that that poor shopkeep, who, if you remember, was just complaining about certain tariff laws about, about imports and exports, has been arrested and has his shop closed for sedition. I've talked before about how scary legality can be here in real life, but that's usually for relatively little things, right? Imagine being accused of sedition. There are few crimes that are higher up on the list than that, at least here in the States. And imagine being accused of that because you said, Man, it sucks that I have to pay taxes. I am exaggerating slightly for, for, for effect, but only slightly. Um... There is a quote in this episode. It's among my favorite quotes in the whole series, actually. Uh, up in this j same general category as that wonderful speech by Jacquard uh, in the previous episode. And that quote is, We will, at last, know peace in our time. <laughs> Let's talk about horror. I've said many times I'm not a fan of horror games or horror movies, but that's because, in my honest opinion, they're not. I've talked about this many times. They're not actually horror movies. They're gore movies. They're violence movies. They're uh, jump scare movies. You know, there's nothing in there that actually horrifies me. It's just gross. That's just my opinion, of course. I have many good friends who are, are definitely into that, and I have a few friends who are even worse against it than I am. Um, horror, for me, is something quiet. Something that, as soon as you think about it, there's just this sense of dread that goes throughout your being. There's an old quote that is one of the most horrifying quotes in modern history. And when I say modern history, I mean going back several centuries. Don't worry, we're from the government, and we're here to hell. We have, on one hand, a polite kind, literally grandfatherly gentleman talks about the loss of lives and peace and how we need to embrace these things. We need to be no more lives lost. I want to make you know a, a, a legacy for my children. I want to give them something for their future. The reason that's so horrifying is this is a person who is perpetuating a great evil and he is doing so as a kind, loving person grandfatherly kind of a guy. He is not, by most definitions of the word, evil. 
He is not some mustache twirling fight. In fact, he's not like the other guy, Mr. Obviously Evil Guy. Again, I still can't remember his name. He is not like that guy. It's actually interesting because if you think about it, this is a variant on the good cop, bad cop scenario. Because Mr. Obviously Evil is the bad cop. Mr. Kind Ambassador is the good cop. This, the reason I say this is a variance is usually the good cop, bad cop thing is a lie. Neither of them are good or bad. They're both just doing their job and trying to lie through their teeth to you in order to manipulate and deceive you into doing what they want. I don't think it's a lie in this case. I think Mr. Obviously Evil Guy is actually kind of a bastard, very manipulative, and frankly open about it in the way he does it in his interactions with Ivanova and with Sheridan. And I think the kindly paternal grandfather guy, you know, the ambassador, is genuinely a caring individual who actually believes what he's doing is correct. They have emulated the good cop, bad cop by sending the right people. And this is, by the way, another example of the whole carrot and the stick approach, isn't it? Because... <laughs> I just... I don't even know what else to say to that. And the way they say things is so brilliant. Uh, one of the things that was pointed out was the things they want people to report on. Things that are dangerous and disloyal. When you... It's a common uh, manipulative tactic to try and hide something bad under something good. You, you, you can see how this theme is just everywhere in this episode. So the idea of, we just want you to do something that you normally do and something that you normally wouldn't. But we lead with this, so your mind's already more receptive, and then we slide this underneath it. Some, something dangerous, you know, some, there might be criminals, there might be terrorists, you know, all that sorts of thing. We want you to report on this kind of stuff, to which her response, if he had stopped the sentence, there would probably be, duh. This is probably what Zach was thinking. I, I, he actually says flat out, give me 50, uh, however many credits a week for being able to do my, the same job I'm already doing, done. But just like with Zach, they don't just want you to do your job. They want you to do your job in this one other little thing. Just this one other thing. This is actually another example of the A to Z thing. I've talked about this a lot, but to summarize, a good progression from good to evil is not just, ah, oh, I'm a good guy, and now I will kill babies. You know, that is jumping from A to Z. A good A to C variant is A to B, B to C, C to D. Because each little step seems reasonable from the previous step, right? So, for example, Zach being asked to confirm what other people have already said, that's a small step. That's, that's acceptable, that's understandable. He could get behind that. I mean, they've already reported it, so it's not like it's a big deal to him. That is a B to C step. That is exactly what that is presented as. That is exactly what that means in literary convention. Um, so the idea being that in the future that might then progress B to C, C to D, E to A. I'm not going to jump forward, of course, I don't want to spoil the future, but that's, you know, that's what that kind of concept means. I kind of lost my train of thought. Uh, right. The other thing that's really horrifying about this episode is the, the reality of the politics. Because we have people who want to do good who can't. Who literally can't. Let's look at Sheridan. This is actually probably my favorite example of this. Uh, and this is the beginning of something that Babylon 5 will be very good at in the future. The precariousness of how they approach political realities. Because they can't just say, to hell with you, we're going to go ahead and provide aid to these Narn. Everything they do and everything they, everything, every way they interact with that is kind of sliding through the lines of legality, trying to make it acceptable in the way they function. So, you know, and, and this, this, okay, let me just, let me just go down the list. I wrote this. So we've got, the, the treaty is not yet signed, so they're not obligated to the Centauri in any way. However, they are jeopardizing their position back at home because of internal politics, because the people back at home want this treaty with the Centauri, and knowing the treaty is now in effect and not con con you know, uh, going with it means that you are effectively losing brownie points, even though you're technically legal. And then there's the fact that you have disloyal crew on your staff, as we saw with the fact that people basically ran off to Mr. The, you know, the, the evil guy and the ambassador guy to say, hey, you know, there's a Narn ship that they're lending aid to secretly. Um, they can't fully give aid to the Narn once the secret's out. They basically, the only thing they can do is say, get the hell out of Dodge, get out of here. 
and that's the best victory they can hope for, and even that has to come at a cost. But they toe the line very carefully so that they are not the ones who provoke the aggressors. But by doing so, they open themselves up to damage. And in fact, Babylon 5 is pretty significantly damaged in the coming battle. Uh, well, I shouldn't say significantly, but it is, a, it is damaged because of the fact that they had to wait for the enemy to punch first. This is the dare, danger of precarious politics and the fact that they have to toe this line, this legal line, very carefully. And then, of course, Sheridan. He hits it brilliantly. He says, this, "Under these, under he actually looks up the regulation. I am obligated to provide aid to the Narn because of this legal regulation, and I am obligated to, uh, you know, respond to this entire aggression because of this litigation, etc., you know, etc." Et and then, of course, we get back to that whole carrot and a stick approach, because Mister Obviously Evil Guy walks forward and says, "You're absolutely right. I agree. Chief of Staff agrees. No complaint there whatsoever." Now that Sheridan's off guard, he hits him with the stick. Oh, well, but if you had done this, or if you'd done this, and you should do this in the future... Oh, and by the way, you have to do this, or we're, move, we're removing you from command. And he, of course, insists on the apology. Which brings me to something I want to share with you personally. Uh, this apology is a brilliant quote. It's actually funny to me, because he never actually gives it to, to the Centauri. <clears throat> I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry we had to defend ourselves against an unwarranted attack. I'm sorry that your crew was stupid enough to fire on a station filled with a quarter million civilians, including your own people, and I'm sorry I waited as long as I did before I blew them all straight to hell. It's a great apology. <laughs> so then, of course, the assassination attempt. It's interesting. Because both ways it kind of works. Either this is one angry Centauri who has too much pride in his people to allow them to be shamed in this way. Or maybe he had family or friends or kin on the ship that was destroyed. Or maybe he just cares because they're Centauri. Who knows? Or this is a political message. We can assassinate. We, the Centauri people, can assassinate the captain of Babylon 5 like that. And let's be blunt. They should have succeeded at that. The only thing that made, the, made it so that Sheridan survived was the reveal of Kosh. I cannot be the only person who, when I first saw this episode, I didn't get a hope spot, or rather, I did get a hope spot feeling from Kosh. In other words, it's like, oh, things are better, wait, no, things are worse. Sheridan himself points out this, you know, the idea that, have they been manipulating us for, for however many years? Have they been affecting us so that we'd respond in just the right way? Yeah, that didn't make me inclined towards the Vorlons at all. Especially after comes the Inquisitor. And there's the obvious reality. <laughs> so, two things I want to cover before I want to get to my last point. The Centauri have really succeeded at something in this. They actually gained a really good victory. They have basically told the other major nation, the other really major power that isn't the Membari, stay out of our business. With their flank covered, they don't have to worry about Earth intervening anymore. That has got to be a huge relief on their military. Now they can just basically go warring uh, all willy-nilly, without hesitation. The other thing I want to mention, Kosh's reveal is an obvious, oh god, they're ready to move. But maybe, maybe it's not quite there. Maybe the Vorlons, oh, never mind, there's a, sh there's a picture of a shadow ship that is now all over the news. Some new alien race. So now the shadows are going to be forced out into the open, and that's bad for everyone. But there's one last thing I want to talk about. This is sort of getting into the spoiler box, but not really. Because everything about this whole episode, about the whole precarious politics and the carrot and the stick approach thing and all that, is reflected in Kosh's decision. Think about it. Ka replace Kosh with Sheridan. Replace Sheridan with Nakal, the, the Narn commander and his heavy cruiser. And, the, and as soon as you do that, all the, situa all, all the two situations line up beautifully. Because Kosh had to make a judgment call against the politics of his people, with all the precarious politics involved in towing the line legally to make sure that his enemy, in this case the, the Shadows, in Sheridan's case the Centauri, would not be feel like they have the legal requirement necessary to really make anything bad happen. 
it's the exact same precarious politics just being played at a lar larger scale and on a higher tier, if you will. And I love that similarity. I love that parallel in the in the two plots because there actually are the two plots. It's just the second plot is so subtle you don't even notice it until it's suddenly shoved in your face. Because the Centauri thing, that's just become small scale. Things are about to get much, much worse. I'll see you next season, guys. It's cool.